afternoon one once again people one and all I'm back here at uh, BMW Motorrad Wolverhampton Rybrook on this beauty look at that the R9T 2009 classic make sure I'm actually recording yes I am 2019 classic in the 719 colours man how gorgeous does that look man just take a, a look around the bike first you know I am all about that retro look at the moment um, I've been out on a couple of those kind of modern super naked bikes the MT10 a few weeks ago and the Super Duke a few weeks before that um, but look at that man, that's just that's just speaking to me that is, that's saying that, you know what, you're at that age now, a little bit of sophistication, you've got a little bit of that throwback on the colours to the fact that you are on a, a speed demon or a cafe racer type star bike and uh, you know what, it just looks so, so pretty, so, so pretty. I've got the speed cowl at the back, the hump, the small hump, the cowl, single seat riding. You can get a tail tidy on this. Uh, sorry, not a tail tidy. You can, apparently you can take off the whole back section where you have just that part there removed and just the seat. So it just looks a lot more. It just looks a lot more kind of retro. But obviously it's got all the 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 the, the, the gadgets. Let's get on it and see what the riding position feels like. <laughs> oh yeah. You know what? I'm alright with that. Oh! That is bizarre mate. That is bloody bizarre. I've never ridden an R90 before. I've never ridden a boxer engine before. But when you get on it, the riding, well, the sitting position is actually quite comfortable. Um, and there's so many things that I possibly want to go through. I try and keep some order um, and present it in a coherent format. But uh, as soon as you get on it, uh, you're a lot more upright. You feel a lot more comfortable compared to, obviously, you know, you guys know now that I'm coming off a uh, Hayabusa, uh, Super Sport, Hyper Sport, whatever the bloody hell they're called. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm saying you guys know that I'm coming off the uh, the Hayabusa, and the Hayabusa was a um, a Super Sport or Hyper Sport or whatever the hell uh, they're called now. And um, getting onto a bike that's a lot more upright is important for me now because. I need to have something that's not going to destroy my back and allow would allow me to ride for hours and hours uh, if I want to or indeed need to um, because I'm at the stage of my life now where I want to enjoy my ride and not get off the bike feeling as though I've been beaten up especially with some of the missions that I want to do the you know riding around into Europe and all of those kind of things so a more upright bike is important for me and within that there's several offerings so you know where do you go uh, super naked possibly if you want to keep the speed um, but as I've been saying through all the other videos I'm at the stage where um, you know I kind of like the classic look I like that kind of retro look um, and the R90 caught my eye um, getting on it you're right the riding position is really comfortable um, and I'm bearing in mind that I've only been on it a couple of three minutes now uh, you know you're a lot more upright even though you feel as though you're on the tank um, your you know your legs aren't cramped up underneath you um, I'm five foot eight and both my feet are touching the floor when I've got it uh, at standstill if I need to put both feet down um, at standstill at standstill um, there is a lot of vibration and apparently this is common with the the boxer engines um, you know you've got a lot of vibration that comes through the bike um, and that's just kind of a classic sign of the fact that you're on one of these um, boxer type uh, engines um, 
So you, you feel that, and when you when you when you give it the beans on the on the throttle at standstill, it leans over to the right, which is a, a strange experience for me um, because I've only ever known that on cars and never really had that experience on bikes. So uh, yeah, that's the the kind of first impression as you as you start it up, fire it up, you get on it. It's got the Akrapovich exhaust on there, this particular model. And these come in all sorts, the R90, uh, they come in the R90 Pure, they come in the R90 Classic, they come in the R90 um, Scrambler, uh, the GS Scrambler kind of version uh, of it. Um, there's so many and they all come with all sorts of different things, but uh, the one that I'm on at the de uh, today is the R90 Classic, which is apparently the most, um, the most bells and whistles bike that BMW does uh, from the, uh, the R90 range. Um, it's got heated grips, it's got electronic menu and all of those kind of things. Um, it doesn't have the sports suspension or ABS or anything like that. They don't offer that on the R90 apparently. Um, but the uh, particular package comes with spoke wheels uh, which uh, are part of the, the kind of sports pack. Uh, I think if, that, if that's right, if memory serves me correctly. And uh, no, no problem. And uh, you know, you, you kind of get that retro look, and also you get this kind of custom tank on aluminium um, with the the, uh, the, the Mars colours, different colour blues, the the red looks really nice. I really, I really, really like the look of it. Um, so first impressions, you know, aesthetically the bike looks really, really nice. Um, you know, I, I, I could quite comfortably see myself uh, on top of this uh, riding it on a weekend or sitting in my garage or on my drive if I ever had a garage or a drive but you know that kind of vision into the future I could actually see that quite comfortably happening um, riding it you know the first couple of five minutes it seems fairly comfortable it's uh, it, it seems like a kind of nice bike to, to be on the riding positions comfortable um, it's not aggressive uh, it's not you know particularly harsh it seems, you know, it's, it's 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 nice. You could enjoy yourself on this, and uh, as the guy in the dealership was saying, you know, there's a, a bit more of an increase in terms of um, uh, riders coming across to this genre of biking, where you know they they actually want to get the leather leather jacket and the Kevlar jeans and the boots. Um, get yourself a nice kind of uh, you know one color lid and you know you look the piece when you're when you're on top of this it's like a, a throwback and on uh, and even having that you can see that you know if you go out on a chilly day you can get the the big leather jacket with the fur line uh, fur lining fur line collars and all that kind of stuff some nice leather gloves and you can see yourself you know I don't, I'm not an advocate of open face helmets but with an open face helmet on sunglasses or whatever it is that tickles your fancy to, to to go out on a ride, you know, uh, either on your own um, or with some mates. Um, so you know, I mean, you, you can you can see that, and this bike kind of fits into that nicely. So if you're not about um, breaking your neck, uh, getting from point A to point B, or throwing your bike around a track, uh, this is probably the direction that you want to head in. Not whether the R90 is the best one to do that, I don't know, because there's lots of other. Uh, offerings uh, in this market, you know, Triumph I got the, the Bonneville and the Thruxton and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Triumph personally, but um, you know, there, there's other bikes in the market that could do that. Uh, some of the, 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 the Jap custom cruisers uh, as well, uh, the VMAX and um, you know, the Intruder. Big bikes, but you know, they're, they're kind of in this, in this space. But this is, um, this is nice, you know, it, that whole image is really nice. The way that the bike, the way that the bike rides, hopefully we'll get an opportunity to explore handling as well. Uh, but the way that the bike uh, rides, certainly in a straight line, the way that it pulls away uh, is comfortable. You know, there's nothing uh, uncomfortable uh, about it. Um, you know, I'm not perched over on the tank. There's no pressure on my on my knees. There's no pressure on my uh, the palm of my wrists or my elbows. Oh, let's try and filter on this beast and bearing in mind that you've got two lumps on either side of you. Um, fairly comfortable. Um, you know, so uh, it feels much more comfortable. You feel as though you're not more upright. There's no, obviously, wind protection. So if you were to tank it, oh, it's actually got a gear indicator as well. There you go, gear indicator. So you, I oh, know that I'm in second. So, you know, if you were to tank it, um, then, you know, uh, I don't know how you'd fare against the, 
the wind blowing back at you or pushing back at you. Um, it's talky, it certainly is talky. But then again, you know, you're almost looking at a 1200cc bike, which is a bit of a antithesis to my whole um, motivation for selling the Busa, which was a 1300 and I wanted to drop down to a litre bike. And to be honest with you, the litre bikes are certainly doing it, man. You know, if the, the, the era of having a big old bike to get you to astronomical speeds quick, you know, it's, it's still a valid, valid argument, but um, the thousands will do it just as just as quick without, uh, well, the super naked certainly without destroying your spine or your posture now. Um, that was certainly my experience for, of the MT-10, uh, the Super Duke as well, which admittedly was a uh, was a 1290, but the MT-10 was just Jesus. That was just something else. Um, so let me go this way. The MT-10 was actually something else. It was just so, so quick. Um, and it was snatchy power. Uh, and this is... Ooh, gotta get used to that kick. Gotta let that uh, clutch off a little bit easier. And you'll be fine. But yeah, the MT-10 was snatchy power. It was instant power. Well, you know, you turn, you, you turn your throttle, and I mentioned this in my video that, you know, there's a, probably an argument to be had that the throttle on the MT-10 was a bit too soft, was a bit too soft, um, and it needed to be a little bit, uh, a little bit harder because it felt as though uh, there wasn't enough resistance within that. And there's a little bit of play in in, in this throttle as well. Um, and even though it's a bigger engine, um, the way that this delivers the power is a lot smoother than the MT-10. Um, now, arguably, the MT-10 was on the chassis and the engine of the R1. Um, whereas, you know, this is a completely different beast um, in terms of what this bike's, I think, trying to do and the market that it's reaching out to. So it's not a, it's not a direct comparison, but just as a rider from an MT-10 onto the R90, you get the impression that this is much more smooth in terms of its power delivery. It's not as quick. I don't think it's intended to be as quick. Uh, but, you know, if you don't want to necessarily get to that speed as quickly as possible, it will certainly carry through uh, past 100 quite comfortably. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a, almost a 1200cc. There's no issues of it hitting that big number. Um, and I think with it being a, a big old lump, a heavy bike, um, it would be fairly planted and I'll try and take it on the motorway to get an idea of whether that's the case but I think it will be fairly planted when you're on the uh, on the open roads and when you're hitting them speeds uh, as well. Um, I just took it around the the short roundabout just to kind of get an idea of what the um, uh, what the handling's like and you know what it's considering it's got these two kind of lumps sticking out either side it handles quite well um, sorry got my itchy nose again uh, it handles quite well leans over quite comfortably there's no there's no issues in terms of the way that it feels you know what it feels like when you're reading it over um, feels fairly fairly comfortable um, now bear in mind that I'm no expert as I've mentioned clearly in my other videos at cornering or anything like that and I wouldn't want to take any bike that I own uh, onto a you know onto a track because I'm just not confident in my abilities to um, to what's it called uh, to keep it upright um, but you know um, respectfully going around bends at a pedestrian pace I'm quite happy to do that and this is the kind of bike that implores you to do that I think if you buy the R90 I don't think you're looking to be ragging it around a racetrack or I don't think you're looking to be you know breaking any kind of speed records whilst you're on the road I think that's a different 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 bike and you've got a whole host of options that will enable you and facilitate that for you um, but with this I think if you buy this it's more of a case of enjoying the ride enjoying the scenery enjoying the time uh, on the bike irrespective of what speed you're going at um, and that's just my kind of take on it Jesus 
right, need to get used to that. You need to get used to that clutch. Oh, bloody hell. That clutch was hard. Release that too quick. My error. And the thing is with these, because they're um, air cooled and they're not, uh, they don't have like a radiator and cooling, uh, coolant within them. So because they're air cooled, uh, you don't necessarily ride these on the red line all the time. Um, rather you use the torque to build the speed up. Um, so it's much more in the lower range. And I've just kind of gone through there in third and the bike's pulled away comfortably, no issues at all. Um, yeah, clutch the shift as well, nice and smooth. Um, make sure that there's nobody coming out from the other end. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that was fourth. Um, at 30, pulling away just under 30 in fourth gear. So the torque's phenomenal on this bike, and once it's moving, you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> it's not poetry. Honestly, it is. It's just, it's like cutting through butter with a warm knife. It's really, really nice. Um, I think the clutch will take a little bit of getting used to. Uh, once you're kind of used to that, then you'll be able to get those smooth transitions from gear to gear, which will be nice. The brakes are kind of sharp and solid. You hear that? That's nice, that's the Akropovich. Uh, the brakes are kind of ni nice uh, and sharp, uh, ABS, um, on this particular model. And uh, the chap at the dealership was saying that the ABS runs through now on all the models. Um, as, uh, as a standard feature, I think it was early, uh, on the earlier models you had to choose it as part of a pack, but now they've put them on all of them. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. But uh, you can choose to have the ABS off as well. You've got the, the button there for it. Why do you want to do that? I'm not entirely sure. Um, but yeah, that's the, an option. So yeah. The BMW R90. Can I see myself buying one of these bikes? You know what? I think I think I can. I think I can. It's all about that kind of style. You know that retro look. 40 plus biker. You know I want to buy a bike that I kind of want to hold on to for a little bit. Jesus, something like I want to get settled down with a woman. But uh, it is that. You know you, you don't want that kind of promiscuous relationship with bikes anymore we're switching from bike to bike to bike to bike to bike after every 12 or 18 months because you found a fault in it or you're too old for it or you just can't bother with the nonsense of it or you know uh, you want something that's more your age so in terms of the first impressions you know it's it's a brand new bike and I really like it and just the kind of nod that I'm getting from the BMW driver on the on the right to me is, the, is what you get, you know, you, you get people appreciating the craft, the design, the artwork, the detail that's got into, into making this thing. And when you get on it, you know, um, it's an enjoyable experience, it's not like it's trying to, trying to kill you, um, you don't feel as though Oh geez, this is going to hurt me because my hands and my knees and my back are going to start aching after about 20 minutes. It's comfortable um, and for the size of it, you know, you wouldn't know that you're on a 11, 1200cc. The brakes are really good, the handling isn't an issue, you can filter on it as well. Um, a couple of observations. Uh, in respect of this particular model, and I don't know if this kind of runs through the rest of them as well, is that there's no holes for the uh, petrol tank, meaning that you need the fuel fuel cap uh, seems to be pressed in as opposed to screwed. In. I don't know if that's the case, but if I look down here, there, there's no holes, so you can't get your your Givy tank lock on there, which is a problem for me because I like to have my a tank bag on top of the uh, on top of the tank, and that's a must, especially for when I'm going um, touring. The other thing is as well, 
um, is finding a way to attach a, uh, a what's it called onto it, a, uh, a mount that you can put your top box on. So I've got a Gibby top box, uh, the mono key, and that comes with a plate, base plate, uh, which needs to be attached to a rack. And on uh, the Busa, I was able to buy the rack, an aftermarket rack, uh, and put the uh, attach the top box to it. On here, I think it's going to be. I'm sure there's, you know, uh, an aftermarket thing available, but if not, then something that's going to have to be engineered to fit to the bike, so you can put your uh, top box on it. Because that's where I generally tend to put all my crap whenever I'm going abroad. Um, or possibly look at using saddlebags, but with the saddlebags the can on this thing on the left hand side sits quite high so uh, I don't know how that would work or how that would feature so uh, a few considerations in respect to that you know I like the display it's fairly straightforward um, I like the, the old kind of analog clocks but I think if you're throwing digital in there as well which they have done it would be nice to have a kind of digital speedo as well, just to tell you where your MPH is. Um, I mean, I'm doing about 30, 35 at the moment, so I can look down and have a look at it and know. Uh, but that's just a personal a personal preference for me. Uh, and also, on this, there isn't a fuel gauge. Now, I understand the argument for not having a fuel gauge, but for me, it's just such a basic thing now. Why wouldn't you bloody put a fuel gauge on? If you've got ABS on a bike, why not bloody hell put a fuel gauge in? Um, it tells you, like it has now, I've got the fuel light come on. Uh, and it tells me that I need to fuel up, but then it's that constant thing of having to um, reset the trip every time I change, or what, every time I fill up just to know how many miles I've done. And if you're in territory that you're not familiar with, um, like if you're riding through Europe, then you need to be conscious of uh, where you are and how far it is to the next. Uh, fuel stop and sometimes you know the petrol stations that you stop are aren't always service uh, uh, in service or they're not working so for me it's, it's, you know it's, I just can't understand why people wouldn't have or put a fuel gauge on it it's just a basic basic thing for me uh, so that's a pet hate for me it doesn't matter what bike it is it's not a direct oh there's a speak of the devil um, it's not a direct thank you very much it's not a direct criticism of this bike but it is one of bikes that choose not to have a fuel gauge on them I just doesn't make any sense to me. So here we are fueling up at petrol station. So look. Right the indicator light is switched as well. Let me have a look. Get this thing into neutral, goes into neutral fairly easily. Make sure that it's down. Turn it off. Go on. I'm paying 128 a litre. So, yeah, as I was saying, that there's no screws on the actual tank. They've concealed them within the plastic underneath, which is a bit of a pain. I think I've got about 12 quid. Because now I need to figure out how I would end up putting my uh, tank bag on. Because I need that, and also these tanks are aluminium, they're not metal, and uh, those are the spoke wheels that I was talking about. They do look smart, don't they? They do look super smart. And all that brushed aluminium on the side as well. I do like the look of that. Obviously when you're on top of the bike you can't see what's underneath you, but you know what you're riding. And just when you know what you're riding, you do like the look of it. Do like the look of that. Right. All right, here we go. Fuel up and ready to go. So, I was moaning about the uh, absence of a uh, fuel gauge, which I think for me is a basic, um, basic necessity on a bike now. And then you've got idiots like that going around the roundabout on a motorbike in a short and t-shirts. I'll never understand that, honestly. In the interests of self-preservation, how much do you have to devalue the reality of your own existence to get on a motorbike with no gear whatsoever, aside from a helmet, 
Um, I think to be honest with you, if you're riding without any gear, you're best off riding without a helmet because the last thing that you want is your head to be uh, Bilston Centre, no, uh, is your head to be fucking fine, okay, and to feel all the pain that your body's going through because you haven't bothered to wear a helmet. Anyway, that's that rant over. So, back onto the bike, uh, let me have a look, let me go this way. Uh, let's head to Walsall Wooden Hall on the M6, um, and let's open up the taps on this thing. Bad. Not bad at all. Got used to the uh, smoothness of the clutch. Now, even though I said this is not all about speed and all that kind of jiggery pokery, you need to have a bike or be able to be comfortable on your bike enough to keep up with your. When I say keep up, keep up safely with the people that you're riding with. So if you're riding in groups, you know, and you're going, there's about, but for, for argument's sake, there's three or four of us that go to France. Oh, bless you. There's three or four of us that go to France, Europe, uh, every year or every other year, yeah? Now, if you're on a bike that doesn't allow you to keep up with the group, then you're constantly going to be playing catch up. So the bike that you get needs to, be powerful enough, nimble enough, and you need to be confident on it enough that allows you to keep up with your friends within a safe, obviously, within a, within a safe framework. So don't do anything that you're not comfortable doing. Don't take any stupid risks. But equally, your bike needs to allow you to do that. Um, and this is a 1200, uh, 1157, I think it is. And even though it's um, even though it's a big old bike, it doesn't deliver power as scandalously as the uh, MT tenders and as I'm sure as the uh, what's it called will do, the uh, S1000R will do, but it still can get you to that speed you know you won't be miles and miles behind it can still hold that speed at the top end if you're doing 80, 90, if you're on the autobahns and you're doing 100, 100 plus you know, it, it, it's quite comfortable at that I'm in third at the moment now, and I'm doing 50, comfortable twist the throttle, and it doesn't snatch me back you know, or it does a little bit there, uh, but you know, it's comfortable doing that speed, it's comfortable getting there, apply the brakes and, and, and they're there, you know, you've got that kind of confidence uh, in the fact that you've got power at the throttle, but you've also got the ability to stop at the throttle as well. Um, so, you know, that's a positive in my book, um, because I was considering a Harley as well, one of my mates said to me, he goes, listen mate, if you're going to get a Harley, then you, you realise you're going to be riding solo. And I thought, what do you mean? Oh, jeez. He goes, you, he goes, you realise you're going to be riding solo. But what do you mean? He goes, you can't, you won't, not you can't, you won't be able to keep up with, with us guys when we're doing our, uh, our missions around France and we're hitting the twisties. So, like, for next year, we're hitting, uh, planning to hit Italy in the Stavino Pass. He goes, how are you going to keep up with us on a big bloody Harley? Even if it is a sportster, he goes, they're just not quick enough, agile or nimble enough. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe you've got a point. So, other routes. Let's look at the other routes. So to Darleston. So, all those things considered, all of those things considered, um, this kind of ticks all those boxes. It does tick all those boxes, and I'm really enjoying it. And I think, to be honest with you, this is going to be a serious contender, unless the. There's the Harley, look at that big thing. Unless the, uh, the S1000R convinces me otherwise, I think out of all the bikes that I've ridden, this is probably going to be the one. Um, that I jump on next. Because I like the whole, like I said, pipe, cigar, sophisticated, retro feel of the bike. All about that, all about that. So, uh, <laughs> I'm actually quite enjoying this, you know, I do like this. And, you know, this is the difference, I mean, this is the bike that I can see myself getting on. And, you know, and, and, and incidentally, the, I like the, the kind of, the, this space is nice and clear. You know, I've got like a clear dial either side, not what gear I'm in, time. 
Uh, I've got the date, if I ever need that, don't, can't imagine that I would, but I'm sure I can change that on the menu adjustment as well. Um, but equally I've got lots of space here to put my things, so I want to mount a sat now. Uh, I'd have to speak to the guys at the workshop and say, listen, where do you plug in my, my, my 12 volt charger? Um, but, the uh, hell? Christ, what would you do that for? Uh, sorry. So, yeah, uh, but there's spaces where I can put my uh, my RAM mount, there's spaces I can put my phone, um, and if I need to mount a sat-nav, there's space where I can, where I can do that. Um, so, you know, there's lots of lots of space uh, on that, which is really, really helpful, really useful as well. Let's head to Canic. Um, that's important in my book, actually. Let's go straight. There. That's important. I think the clutch for me is going to take a bit of getting used to because on the booster, um, I think I was just used to snatching at it and uh, I got used to the bike. Hello, oh, chap, what would you do that for? Mr. West Midlands Platinum National Express chap. Bit of a cock. Let's see what it's like on the overtake. I was there. No, it's a nimble little bike. And okay, let's take Hampton A454 first, second, third, third exit. And you know, I've just gone over a, a small kind of pothole. You know, just swaddled it up. Swaddled it up. And it swaddled it up without compromising the, the speed and the handling of the bike, if that makes sense. So. It's not like so soft where you can't throw it around, but then again, it's not. It doesn't need to be that hard because the bike is that breakneck fast. If that makes you sense, if that makes sense, it's a, it's a, it's a relatively quick bike. Don't, you know, don't get me wrong. Or, I mean, the, the, the speed is 140, so you'll probably quite comfortably do 100, 110, and unless you're going flat out on the autobahn, uh, where else are you going to do that kind of speed? Or, or you're on the track uh, and you're hitting the opening, you know, start straight finish. Where well, you need to be at about, what, you know, 140, 150. Where else are you going to do that kind of speed? It's nice. The setup of the bike, in terms of how hard or soft it is, is requisite with how quick the bike is. The MT10, you know, was tough, but you've got an R1 engine in that. Detuned, alright, fair enough, but still, it's an R1 engine. And that thing was just like Jesus got to hold on to your wig if, uh, if you give it the beans and uh, I suspect the, uh, the S1000R will be like that as well. The thing is that you know I miss and this is just me wanting something on a bike rather than needing it you know just the little things you know the the, the, uh, the 1000R for argument's sake comes with uh, the sports adjustment the ESA you know electronic uh, 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 suspension adjustment comes with cruise control. Now I, I like having cruise control and I think that they, they probably missed a trick on this bike um, not putting it on because you know if you're going for like a that, that whole you know um, not necessarily speed but kind of comfort and that retro image look you want to be able to to go from location to location uh, why would you not put cruise control on a bike or offer the option of having it on there uh, as opposed to a carte blanche to say no, we're not going to have it. You know, for me, if I want to sit on an A road, for argument's sake, and go from, you know, Birmingham to Coventry on the A45, then I'd like to stick it on uh, cruise control and cruise all the way there, as opposed to having to manually hold the throttle there. So I think that they've just kind of just missed a trick, or just not thought through uh, what they need and why. So. Overall, you know, aside from those kind of things where, you know, you, you haven't got the tech that you've got on the other bikes. Um, other than that, you know, it's, it's it's not a bad show. This is seriously, seriously a contender, man. Seriously a contender. I like the way it looks. I love the way it looks. I like the way it rides. I've been on it probably for about... 40 minutes now and it is just a joy I'm enjoying being on it at slow speed I'm enjoying opening the 
opening the throttle on it. I like the sound that it makes. I like the way that it handles and feels. Um, and inc incidentally, this is the first bike that I've test ridden that I've not referenced the Hayabusa. Now maybe that's just because it's the third bike now and I've accepted that, listen, mate, the is a different animal. It's a different bike. You can't keep on making those comparisons. Maybe it's that. Or maybe it's just that good as a retro naked or retro classic modern. That I don't need to think about the Hayabusa. It's not making me think about the Hayabusa. Rather, I'm gauged on, on this bike. Maybe that's what it is. And I'm, I'm leaning more towards that. Because, you know, when I twist the throttle, right, I haven't got that... The expectation is not there for it to have breakneck speed or accelerate to an astronomical speed. Because that's not this bike. You know, it's not designed to be that kind of bike. As soon as you look at it, you realise, well, actually, you know what, it's not that. Whereas with the, with the MT-10, when you put a R1 engine in that kind of bike, you, you're making a kind of clear statement. You're saying to people, listen, this is what this bike is. It's got an R1 engine in it. So the expectation, I thought, subconsciously is already there. That this is going to be a quick bike. So what are you going to measure it against? Well, you're going to measure it against maybe the quickest bike that you've ever had. But which for me was the Hayabusa. And I think that'll probably be the case when I get on the S1000R as well. That I'll measure it against the quickest bike that I've had, which was the Hayabusa. But with this, it's not like that. You know, I look at it and I instantly know that, listen, this is a different animal. You know, it's not a um, uh, it's not a sports bike, it's not a speed bike. It's a kind of a modern classic retro. And the, the, the purpose of me getting on here is not to set any bloody world records, but rather to enjoy my ride the way that I want to enjoy it. To have fun, you know, doing the twisties and navigating. Um, navigating the, the city uh, and wherever it is that I'm going and this does that and if you look at the reflections on it <laughs> does it lovely beautifully you know as you go through the uh, thing you, you people look at it if you go through the reflections of the mirror and you think yeah actually you know what it looks really nice mate it looks really smart so it's a trade-off uh, speed for aesthetics um, and speed for image and I'm, I'm happy with that I'm happy with that I like it I really like it I've been on it for almost 40 minutes now and uh, you know I'm still comfortable okay so I'm gonna end this vlog and because I need to save the battery for my second vlog on the S1000R I like it I really, really like it. Anybody who's thinking of transitioning from a sports bike to a naked bike, whether that's a super naked or a retro classic like this, um, this is certainly a contender. Certainly a contender. It's got the some of the mod cons, not all of them though, and probably not as many as I'd like for it to have. But it certainly is a contender um, to consider. You know, it's uh, comfortable. Let's chuck it around here. Look at that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it certainly is a contender. I'm really, really enjoying this whole experience of being on here. Uh, I've really enjoyed the R90. And you know what? For the for the kind of money that they're asking second hand, um, it's seriously not a bad show. You know, you know, you can get a really, really good one, low mileage, uh, late model. Um, for you know a decent amount of money but uh, worth considering worth considering right so I'm just gonna pull over for a sec and uh, switch off the camera that's me adios people until the S1000R review